So thank you, Father Lopez, uh, for the invitation. Uh, you may know that uh, parts of the conference are being filmed and streamed over the internet, and my wife told me that she and the kids will be watching uh, <laughs> on a computer at home. But we have a principle or a rule, uh, no TV in the house, and I'm pretty sure this counts as TV. Uh, but, but I think my wife's plan is brilliant. Um, make the kids watch dad give a lecture on Dignitatis Humanae and they'll never want to watch television again. <laughs> so my title is uh, Religious Freedom and Truth, the Contribution of Pope Benedict XVI. In the Apostolic Constitution Humanae Salutis, which officially convoked the Second Vatican Council, Pope John XXIII indicated the basic concern of the upcoming council. He said, today the church is witnessing a crisis underway within society. While humanity is at the threshold of a new age, tasks of immense seriousness await the church as in her most tragic periods of history. It is a question, in fact, of bringing the modern world into contact with the perennial life-giving energies of the gospel a world which exalts itself with its technical and scientific conquests, but which also bears the effects of a temporal order that some have wanted to reorganize by excluding God. For the Council Fathers, this program of bringing the modern world into contact with the gospel involved a twofold task. First, a, a renewed traditio, or a handing on of the faith of the church. The greatest concern of an ecumenical council, said John the 23rd, is this, that the sacred deposit of Christian doctrine be guarded and taught more efficaciously. The second requirement was a discernment of the signs of the times that acknowledged both the positive developments of modernity as well as modernity's pervasive forgetfulness of God, or what would later be identified as the tragic split between gospel and culture. In an important address to the Roman Curia during the first year of his pontificate, Pope Benedict XVI recalled the guiding vision of John XXIII and the significance of the Council's achievement. He said, quote, in the great dispute about man which marks the modern epoch, the Council had to focus in particular on the theme of anthropology. It had to question the relationship between the Church and her faith on the one hand and man and the contemporary world on the other. The question becomes even clearer if, instead of the generic term contemporary world, we opt for another that is more precise. The Council had to determine in a new way the relationship between the Church and the modern age. These words shed light on why Benedict considers the text on religious freedom one of the major accomplishments of Vatican II, a teaching which opens the way for a new encounter with the Gospel. It is important to note how for Pope Benedict, the two basic tasks of the Council, handing on the faith of the Church and determining anew the relationship between the Church and the modern age, should not be juxtaposed or merely placed side by side. At the heart of the Church's missionary dialogue with the modern world is a renewed awareness of the Catholicity of her mission, which is rooted in Jesus Christ, the Alpha and the Omega. In other words, the driving force, the inner measure, and the telos of the Church's encounter with modernity is the mystery of Christ, who, in revealing the love of the Father, reveals the original structure and the purpose of creation in all of its dimensions. And here I arrive at my thesis. Pope Benedict's contribution to the interpretation of Dignitatis Humanae, and thus the meaning of religious freedom in our time, is a comprehensive theological anthropology or what we might describe as a Chalcedonian Christocentrism that views Jesus Christ unconfusedly as the key to nature and grace, reason and faith, the temporal order and our hope for eternal life with God. Understanding the meaning of human existence in light of God's revelation in Christ opens up a new sense of the idea of freedom in relation to truth, as well as a new sense of the distinct integrity of the political order. In order to better understand the significance of Pope Benedict's Christocentrism, it is necessary to recall the sharp debates that surrounded the drafting of Dignitatis Humanae. 
and that have accompanied its reception. So in what follows, I will begin by outlining the two basic positions within the majority that supported the Declaration on Religious Freedom. Part two will present Pope Benedict's interpretation of the text by focusing on how he conceives the relationship between truth and freedom. Supremely revealed in the mystery of Christ, the unity of truth and freedom has its roots in the order of nature, where it is disclosed in a privileged way in the fruitfulness of human love. Thus, by way of conclusion, I will say a word about the importance of the family as a mediating institution. Part one, the conciliar debate. The debate on religious liberty, said Joseph Ratzinger, will in later years be considered one of the most important events of the council already rich enough in important events. There were in fact two distinct debates that shaped the drafting of Dignitatis Humanae. Um, the first debate is perhaps better known. It was characterized by resolute opposition to the idea of religious freedom on the grounds that this doctrine represented a sharp departure from the magisterial teaching of the 19th and 20th century. The opponents of religious freedom, uh, an articulate and passionate minority that included figures such as uh, Cardinals Ottaviani and Ruffini, um, argued that truth alone has the right to freedom. Uh, error may at best be tolerated. In Cardinal Ottaviani's words, quote, the civil authority also, not only each citizen, has the duty of accepting the revelation proposed by the church. Accordingly, civil authority has the duty to exclude from legislation and public activity everything it would judge to be capable of impeding the church from attaining its eternal end. In short, uh, that was the end of the quote. In short, the right to religious freedom belongs only to those adhering to the true religion. An overwhelming majority of council fathers deemed this position to be inadequate to the dignity of the person, the meaning of truth, and the nature of political authority in relation to the common good. Under the direction of Cardinal Bea, the Secretariat for the Promotion of Christian Unity produced six successive drafts of a schema on religious liberty. These texts were the object of intense scrutiny and discussion, both on the council floor and within the subcommission charged with revising the text. Within the majority that supported the declaration, there emerged two distinct approaches to the nature and foundation of religious freedom. The debate between these two groups, uh, customarily, uh, perhaps misleadingly, but customarily identified as the American school and the French school, has continued to function as a sort of fault line in the reception of Dignitatis Humanae. The American bishops and theological advisors, championed by John Courtney Murray, approached the issue of religious freedom as formally, uh, a formally juridical or constitutional concept. The two key principles underlying the American approach are a negative understanding of freedom as immunity from coercion and the total incompetence of the state in regards to religious matters. By contrast, the French school, whose concerns Carol Wojtyla shared, sought to ground the right to religious freedom in the duty of the human person to seek the truth about God, a duty rooted in man's nature. While recognizing the transcendence of religious acts, the French approach, of, the French approach affirmed the state's responsibility for the common good and therein a responsibility to recognize and favor the religious life of its citizens. In order to grasp the difference between these two approaches to religious freedom, it is helpful to consider their respective answers to three interrelated questions. What is the first meaning of freedom? What is the importance of truth within the political order? And what is the nature and end of political authority? Regarding the first, the American school tends to conceive freedom primarily in negative terms, freedom from, immunity from coercion, the first meaning of freedom is personal autonomy, the exigence to act on one's own initiative. The French position, by contrast, emphasizes that freedom exists within a natural order of relations. Coincident with the right to immunity is a responsibility to seek the truth about God. Freedom is essentially relational. Regarding the question of truth, it should be noted that both schools emphasize that human beings have a moral obligation to a transcendent order of truth. 
But for the Americans, the question of truth has no relevance in the political order. Thus, Murray writes, quote, within the social order, which is the order in which human rights are predicated, man's fulfillment of his personal responsibility toward truth is juridically irrelevant. This position is echoed by Pietro Pavan, who claims that, quote, religious freedom does not concern the relation of the person to truth. The French position, by contrast, grounds the right to religious freedom in the human person's obligation to seek the truth. Particularly noteworthy here is the intervention of Bishop Ancel in September of 1965. Speaking in the name of 100 French bishops, Ancel said, referring to the fourth draft of the text, quote, the connection that exists between the obligation to seek the truth and religious freedom has not yet been made clear. Certainly, it has often been said that man has the obligation to seek the truth. Likewise, it has been said that religious freedom presents no objection to this obligation. But at no time, unless I am mistaken, has the positive connection between these two been made clear. Thus, in a few words, I would like to put forward this ontological foundation and thereby show the necessary connection that exists between the obligation to seek the objective truth and religious freedom itself. My proposition is as follows. The ontological foundation of religious freedom is the very obligation to seek the truth. For in fact, every man, because he is a human being that is endowed with reason and free will, is bound to seek the objective truth, to hold fast to it, to order his whole life according to its demands. This principle thus has its foundation in the very nature of man." Uh, end of quote. Uh, Gilles Routier notes that this intervention made a deep impression on uh, Pope Paul VI and would win uh, Bishop Ansel membership in the commission that would make the final revisions to the text. Um, in an earlier intervention, Bishop Wojtyla had anticipated Ansel's concerns with the concise statement, uh, sine veritate, non dator libertas. Without truth, there is no freedom. The third question concerns the nature and end of political authority. At the heart of the American approach to religious freedom is a claim regarding the total incompetence of the state in religious matters. During the conciliar debate, this issue was often framed in terms of the criteria by which a government might legitimately limit the right to religious freedom. In the third draft, the limiting principle of public order was introduced. Uh, Murray, who, who authored this schema, comments, unlike the broader concept of the common good, public order embraces only those fundamental values that are necessary for the sheer coexistence of the citizenry. The French position, by contrast, sought to reintroduce the idea of the common good as the purpose of political authority. Insofar as man, by virtue of his natural relation to God, is ordered to seek the truth, the putative neutrality of the state vis-a-vis -vis religious truth is a fiction. Instead, the state should be open to a transcendent order, and the state should acknowledge and favor the religious life of its citizens. Although it is beyond the scope of this paper, a good argument can be made showing how the revisions to the text, especially those introduced in the fifth and sixth drafts, shifted the final version of the Declaration decisively in the direction of the French position. The situation is complicated by the fact that the dominant reception and interpretation of Dignitatis Humanae has tended to emphasize the line of argument developed by John Courtney Murray. In the widely read Abbott edition of the documents of Vatican II, Murray introduced the text of Dignitatis Humanae, he translated the text, and he provided extensive commentary uh, in a series of annotations. In general, he tended to downplay or ignore key revisions to the text that were introduced as a result of the interventions of Carol Wojtyla and other council fathers concerned with the order of truth and the common good. In several of the commentaries that he wrote immediately following the council, Murray did express dissatisfaction with the final version of Dignitatis Humanae. He especially objected to what he called, quote, the prominence given to man's moral obligation to seek the truth as somehow the foundation of the right to religious freedom. He goes on to argue that the duty to seek the truth does not deserve a place in the structure of a demonstration of the right to religious freedom. The reason is that it fails to yield the crucial political conclusion 
that governments should not hinder individuals or religious communities from public worship. For example, think of a Catholic government or a communist government. These are his examples. Uh, these governments need not concern themselves with man's duty to seek the truth. They can simply maintain that they already have the truth, and consequently they are entitled. In fact, it is their duty to re re repress public manifestations of error. There is a crucial presupposition in Murray's argument that needs to be brought to light. Uh, truth is essentially unfree, or at least indifferent to freedom. This is why a Catholic state in possession of the truth, in Murray's hypothesis, would no longer be concerned with the freedom of its citizens. At the same time, political freedom is conceived in purely formal or instrumental terms. It may be the case that freedom allows one to arrive at the terminus of truth, but in itself, freedom has nothing to do with the truth. Freedom is simply autonomy, the capacity to act on one's own initiative. It is here that the substance of Pope Benedict's theological anthropology sheds light on the disputed meaning of dignitatis humanae. So part two, Pope Benedict on truth and freedom. The theme of truth runs like a guiding thread throughout the corpus of Joseph Ratzinger, Pope Benedict XVI. The distinguishing feature of his understanding of truth is the idea that truth is an order of love. Truth is a transcendental property of being, verum es ends, he says, quoting Thomas Aquinas, uh, that is disclosed in the order of persons. Ultimately, writes Benedict, truth is a person. As an order of love, truth includes freedom as essential to its own fullness. Reciprocally, freedom is not merely an empty form, an ability to do what one wants. In the words of Ratzinger, Freedom means full membership, being at home, participation in being itself. Freedom, he says, is identical with ontological dignity, which of course makes sense only if ontological dignity is really dignified, the gift of love and being given in love. These words are worth repeating. Freedom is the gift of love and being given in love. The circumcession of freedom and truth has its deepest roots in the mystery of God's being love. God himself is a communion, an eternal exchange of life and love. The guiding principle of the encyclical Caritas and Veritate is the teaching that everything has its origin in God's love, everything is shaped by it, and everything is directed toward it. For Benedict, being created in the image of a Trinitarian God means that the human person is essentially or constitutively relational. In the words of Augustine, what is so much yours as yourself? What is so little yours as yourself? The innermost core of our personal identity, our I, is itself a gift from another and for another. The original structure and the final perfection of human freedom is communion. According to Benedict, this relational anthropology is fully revealed in the mystery of Jesus Christ, whose being and mission are summed up in the word son. To be a son, he tells us, is to be in relation. It involves giving up the autonomy that is closed in on itself." End of quote. At the same time, the evidence for this relational anthropology is also available to reason, especially a philosophical reason that is open to faith. The astonishing existence of a child, a child who exists for its own sake as an undeserved gift, yet in utter dependence upon others, discloses the nature of human freedom in its inviolable dignity and its original openness to God. Human freedom is essentially a gift, and as a gift it is structurally receptive. How does this anthropological vision bear on the meaning of religious freedom? Um, first and foremost, Pope Benedict decisively rejects the tendency noted above to separate freedom and truth. Here we can recall Murray's concern that a state in possession of the truth would have no interest in fostering the freedom of its citizens. Pope Benedict's reply is straightforward. Uh, this argument is predicated on a reductive account of truth coupled with a partial or fragmented notion of freedom. 
truth of its own inner nature elicits and requires a free assent. In his intervention at the council, Bishop Wojtyla said, there is no freedom without truth. Pope Benedict agrees wholeheartedly and adds, there is no truth without freedom. The truth, he says, cannot, I quote, cannot unfold except in an otherness open to God, who wishes to reveal his own otherness in and through my human brothers and sisters. Hence, it is not fitting to state in an exclusive way, I possess the truth. The truth is not possessed by anyone. It is always a gift which calls us to undertake a journey of ever closer assimilation to truth. Truth can only be known and experienced in freedom. For this reason, we cannot impose truth on others. Truth is disclosed only in an encounter of love." End of quote. Regarding the interpretation of Dignitatis Humanae, Pope Benedict concurs with the decision taken during the Council to revise the schema in order to ground religious freedom on man's obligation to seek the truth. He writes, openness to truth and perfect goodness, openness to God is rooted in human nature. It confers full dignity on each individual and is the guarantee of full mutual respect between persons. Religious freedom should be understood then not merely as immunity from coercion, but even more fundamentally as an ability to order one's choices, choices in accordance with truth. The church's teaching on religious freedom is not, in the first place, a, a juridical or a constitutional proposal. It is first a teaching regarding the transcendent dignity of the human person, who is created in love and called to seek the truth and live in communion with the truth. Why is it so important to emphasize the Christian anthropological vision of Dignitatis Humanae? Um, why is it a mistake to conceive the church's teaching as primarily juridical or constitutional? The juridical approach developed by John Courtney Murray would seem to allow the church to make peace with modernity's liberal institutions while granting her the freedom to resist problematic aspects of liberal ideology. But as others at this conference will no doubt argue in more depth, the liberal institutions of our culture are not empty or neutral. They presuppose and aggressively impose a vision of the human person in relation to God as well as a metaphysical account of the relationship between freedom and truth. The church is called to offer resistance not simply by requesting a sphere of life where we can still hold fast to our private beliefs and quaint practices. The defense of religious freedom stands or falls with the truth of the human being who is created in the image of God and made for communion. In an address given uh, the day before Pope John Paul II died, um, Cardinal Ratzinger suggested that we are facing, quote, a culture that constitutes the absolutely most radical contradiction, not only of Christianity, but of the religious and moral traditions of humanity. The reason for his dire warning stems from mankind's new power of self-manipulation which presupposes and extends the separation of freedom and truth. He said, again, I quote, having deciphered the components of the human being, man is now capable, so to speak, of constructing man himself, who thus no longer comes into the world as a gift of the creator, but as a product of our action, a product that therefore can be selected according to the exigencies established by ourselves. Thus the splendor of being an image of God no longer shines over man, which is what confers on him his dignity and inviolability. During the past few years, uh, the eugenic project of taking control of and directing human conception and birth has continued to gather momentum, uh, now accompanied and supported by the attempt to redefine marriage. In our time, defending religious freedom means defending the truth about marriage and the truth about human conce conception and the gift of new life. Why? 
the anthropological vision of liberal institutions cannot tolerate a natural order of relations that in some sense precedes and informs human freedom. In the words of Joseph Ratzinger, the family is the primordial cell of freedom. As long as it survives, a minimal sphere of freedom is still secured. For this reason, dictatorships will always aim at breaking up families in order to, to eliminate this sphere of freedom that is exempt from their control. End of quote. Uh, a dictatorship of relativism seeks to break up families in a subtle way. Uh, each person, we are told, should be able to freely decide for himself or herself how to live a meaningful and committed life. Uh, marriage means whatever two consenting adults want it to mean. Of course, uh, you Catholics, you strange Catholics, are still free uh, to hold fast to your antiquated belief that marriage is by nature a permanent and exclusive union ordered to the procreation of children. Um, you can still get married in your churches. What goes unnoticed is the fact that the social and legal meaning of marriage as something more than a provisional contract entered into for the personal fulfillment of two individuals has been undermined. The possibility of saying yes to an objective form that transcends the freedom of each spouse is diminished. The result is a certain darkening of horizons or a loss of intelligibility and paradoxically a loss of genuine freedom without self-transcendence, which involves a response to something good and beautiful that precedes my will, there is no real freedom. The reason why our post-Christian culture devotes so much energy to deconstructing and destabilizing marriage, and especially the mystery of human conception, is that these realities provide a touchstone for recognizing and communicating the original truth and goodness of human existence and by analogy, the truth and goodness of creation as a whole. In its defenseless beauty and dependence on others, a child is a concrete symbol of human dignity and human freedom in its constitutive openness to God. As both uh, Pope John Paul II and Pope Benedict have emphasized, a crisis of marriage and family means a crisis for civilization. Uh, I want to conclude on a hopeful note. Uh, uh, it is important to remember that while the family is the primordial cell of freedom uh, and the foundation of the social order, uh, the family itself is grounded on something unshakable, uh, the plan and the fidelity of God, who in Jesus Christ has communicated the very substance of his life and love. The mystery of Christ's Eucharist shows us both the unimagined grandeur of the Father's love and how priceless man is in God's eyes. Uh, the Eucharist, writes Joseph Ratzinger, is the genuine reality. This is the yardstick, the heart of things. Here we encounter that reality against which we need to learn to measure every other reality. Uh, this gift, at once human and divine, is the perfect expression of freedom in its relation to truth. The liturgy of the church is at once an eschatological sign, um, a promise of eternal life beyond the confines of death, uh, a city beyond the confines of the state, and the seed for a renewal of human culture based on the true dignity of each person and the common good that holds society together. We will remember Pope Benedict as a steward of this mystery, um, a faithful uh, servant of God someone whose, uh, whose life bears witness to the patient and all-encompassing love of God. Uh, thank you. <laughs>